we're live. Good afternoon and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day, even with its technical difficulties. Uh, we have had a little difficulty logging in to Facebook Live today, so we finally got it up and running. Uh, we hope it remains that way throughout the entire service. But if we have to close down and come back, just consider it a commercial break and you can go get popcorn, I don't know. Uh, and, and use the restroom and not interrupt anybody or have anybody look at you as you creep down the aisle of the church. We are glad that you are joining us as we continue to do what we know to do to worship God during this time of a global pandemic, during these strange times as it is. So we are glad you are here. A couple of announcements. Uh, just a reminder that um, the bird box continues to go strong and we will be dropping off food for folks today to deliver throughout the week. If you know groups or organizations who would like to donate to that ministry, please have them reach out to us and we will be sure to let them know how they can go about that process. Also, we will have our fellowship hour tonight at uh, 6.30 and look forward to you being there with us. We'll send out our Zoom invitations. Zoom seems to be working great today. So we'll send out our Zoom invitations later on this afternoon. And if you don't get one and would like to enjoy that time with us, please feel free to email me or text me um, or Facebook me if you can get through and let us know. For those of you who are on Facebook, I would love for you to note your attendance with us through making a comment or a like, um, and that way we have, know that you are here and we each can greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, we are glad that you are here to worship with us on this day. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to worship as I ask Sydney to come and lead us in our unison call to worship. Please join me in our unison call to worship. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I call, you answered me and you increase the strength of my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Our opening hymn today is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
The pressure to conform to this world, to capitulate to earthly powers rather than fear the Lord, tempts us, and sometimes we give in to that temptation. We confess Jesus is Lord with our lips, but our actions reveal that our loyalty lies elsewhere. Nonetheless, God is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. With the confidence of the children of God, we join together and confess our sin. Lord, we grow hard-hearted, seeing each other as competing for scarce resources rather than one human family created and cared for by you, our God of infinite abundance. We conform easily to the ways of the world, striving endlessly for those things that do not satisfy, practicing greed, and participating in systems that hurt people and creation. You call us to another way, the way of Christ Jesus our Lord, a way of compassion and justice, love and service. You offer us a life of joy and grace, mercy and redemption, readily available to us when we repent and seek you and your righteousness first. We turn to you now, forgive and free us, we pray. Continue in silence. We can trust that when we call out to God, God hears and responds. When we humble ourselves and honestly confess, God forgives and makes of us new creations. Friends, believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The lectionary scripture I'm about to read, it, it's one pretty familiar to most of us. It's one of those classic flannel board Sunday school lesson stories. You, you, you remember the flannel boards, don't you? Man, they were the best. L little cardboard type pictures of that they were supposed to stick to the flannel board as, as the storyteller told the story. You know, a, a, a baby Moses in a basket and, and a princess and, and a river and, and, and Miriam, the big sister there, and, and some reeds or, or bulrushes. That, that's what we called them when I was growing up. Maybe a palace where the evil Pharaoh resided. I think from preschool through about grade five, at least once a year, we tried to put Moses up on the flannel board, but, but they only sent Moses, you know, th those things once with the Sunday school material. So, so Moses would stay up there in, in the basket for, for maybe the first two years. But then I think every year that followed, poor Moses would line, wind up on the floor before the story ended. The, the story, it seems so simple, a kind, almost even a joyous story. And I think we remember those childhood lessons and, and the good feelings about being together in Sunday school with our friends and a teacher we knew loved us. And so when we hear the story, when we hear it or we read it again as part of our daily Bible lessons or a devotional, we view it through those same childlike, innocent eyes. But as I read the story to you today, I invite you, I invite you to view it in a different way. Listen to it as if you had never heard the story before. Don't simply assume that you know everything that has happened already. Because I think if you listen, there's some nuances. 
There's some nuances that are there in this story. Because this story, friends, this story is full of radicalism and rebellion. Oh, we want to remember it as some sort of Dr. Seuss book. But the, even the famous Dr. Seuss claimed that his writings were subversive as, I'm in church, subversive as Hades. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell you before I read it, I would propose that this story I'm about to read is the kind of good trouble that the prophets and the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis and Gandhi and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and Archbishop Desmond Tutu would espouse that we, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, need to be getting into if we are to be about truly creating God's beloved community. So hear now, hear now these words. Listen deeply as I read from Exodus chapter 1, beginning with verse 8 and going through chapter 2, verse 10. Then, then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came into power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out... They will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose names were Seraphah and Pua, when you are helping the women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby that is to be born is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let the girls live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was good, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him, no, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus art for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood hidden at a distance to see what would happen to him. The Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. 
She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby, and he was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then Moses' sister asked him, asked Pharaoh's daughters, Shall I go? Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, you who art our strength and our redeemer. In Christ, amen. Friends, friends, did you hear it? I mean, were you listening? Because in spite of the fact, in spite of the fact that we remember this as a happy story of God saving a baby with a basket, the truth of the matter is that it is a story. It is a story of God's people resisting evil, the evil found in this empire. It is the story of a people, of the people of God causing good trouble, good trouble, so that justice might be done. And it is the story of God's people actively resisting injustice, even if it meant lying and being a bit underhanded and deceiving law and order rulers so that light might shine into the dark places. And friends, friends, it is a story of rebirth and recreation and salvation coming again as a reminder that God is continually restoring creation and inviting us to be part of the kingdom of God as we each live towards that promised day. Now first, first as we get into the story, we, we need to look at some of the nuances of the text, which I think we missed in Sunday school, but are important to really understanding the intent of this entire story. To do this, you need to know something about the Hebrew language. Hebrew is economical in its number of words. It has a lot of words that can mean a lot of different things. Actually, it has one word that can mean several different things. Translating it is never easy. In some cases, it's because there is no English equivalent. And in other cases, because there are multiple equivalents. That's the case with this text. Because... If we're not careful, it's very easy, very easy to miss the allusions to Genesis found here in these first few verses. You see, Exodus chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 are, are important but because the Hebrew people would recognize that they were referring back to the creation story and to the flood in Genesis with Noah. You see, the, the NRSV translates the phrase in verse 2, and when she saw that he was a fine baby. That's not what I read, if you'll recall, because the Hebrew word used also is the same, the same language, the same phrase that, that is used in Genesis 1. In the creation story, 
where at the end of each day, you remember it, it says, and God saw that it was good. So Exodus 2.2 2 could just as easily read, the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was good. Then in Exodus 2, verse 3, the NRSV uses the English word basket to describe the container into which Moses was placed. It's the word we're familiar with, but the word in Hebrew is the very same word that is used for ark in the story of Noah. With just two phrases, the beginning of Exodus. The beginning of Exodus incorporates the story of creation of the world into the story about the creation of the Israelites as a people. No longer just the, the sons of, of Abraham or, or just some clan, but about a nation to be born. A nation that would be a family to be the very children of God. And as children of God, they're to be co-creators in the renewal of the world. Moses is indeed good, though far from perfect. And he indeed will be a living ark that delivers the people of Egypt from oppression and certain death. Friends, this is indeed a rebirth and recreation story, but it's also a story of the destruction of evil systems. Because truth be known, truth be known, creation is a powerful and a disruptive process. And this is the story about one of the most disruptive processes we know, the birth of a child. Any family who's ever had a child born into it knows that in the midst of that beautiful creation, there's some disruption and the world is turned upside down. Such was the case here. But it wasn't just about a baby being born. Instead, it was also about a group of women. Notice the story is all about women. A group of women who began the process of opposing injustice. Oh, it got messy and, and, and it, got, it, it got dirty, kind of like the mucky, muddy river Moses was placed in. But you see, sometimes, sometimes we're called to get down in the mud. Sometimes our work is there in the bulrushes and the weeds. Sometimes the work of the gospel causes us to go into places and get in a little bit of good trouble in order to bring about the freedom, the freedom for God's people from living a life of oppression and tyranny. Now first, the first two people, the first two women we find in this story are the two brave midwives. They are given a direct order from Pharaoh, who if you remember the text is obviously a ruthless sovereign. This is a king, this is a king who lives in fear. I mean, in spite of the king's own assessment of the Hebrews in verse 9, that they've, they've grown more populous than the Egyptians, historians will tell you the fact that it simply wasn't true. And then he says in verse 10, to, to further compound his false statement, a little bit of xenophobia, a little bit of racism. It's evident he's trying to find a strategy to create an enemy within, a scapegoat to stir up fear about these foreigners, these immigrant people. 
The Pharaoh wastes no time putting a plan together, a plan together to take this new enemy, this new enemy of the Hebrew people, this dangerous element living within their borders, and he's going to deal with them. He's going to put them in their place. He's going to, he's going to make them afraid. He's going to deal ruthlessly with them. In fact, he has no qualms even in infant side. It's evident that he is a dangerous individual, someone to be feared. Yet two lowly midwives decide to resist the empire. It's an act of civil disobedience. Told to kill, they instead put their lives to risk and boldly lie. And friends, friends, it is a whopper. I haven't been through childbirth, but I've seen it. This is one major lie, but it also plays, it plays into this, into this king's racism and xenophobia. The midwives, the midwives called back to the king. They, they discussed the breeding habits of, of Hebrew women, saying these, these Hebrew women, they're, they're not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous. They give birth before the midwives can even make it to them. So when Pharaoh sees that he won't be able to convince the Israelites to kill their own children, he turns to his people to the Egyptian population, telling them to throw baby boys into the Nile River. We kind of glance over that part, don't we? We move on to the next part of the story because it's hard for us to hear and to wonder, how many children, how many children were drowned by people simply doing their law and order patriotic duty for the Egyptian Pharaoh. But the resistance, the resistance in spite of this fear doesn't end with the midwives. Moses' mother finds a way to save her baby from being killed. First, first she hides the child and then, then knowing that she can't hide him any longer, she puts him in a basket and has the basket put into the Nile River. She's actually, she's actually following the law here, isn't she? But she's creating a powerful symbol, a powerful symbol by, by making this basket, this basket, a, a symbolic ark and placing it in the river. It's a symbolic act of defiance of the evil of the king. And that's where it seems the story should end in this symbolic act. You see, the, the adults have had their chance. They, 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 they've lied to the king. That they've created a, a symbolic statement there. But frankly, in a matter of a few hours, maybe a day at most, this child, this child will surely die. But along, along come the young people. Young people with their vision and their hope and their optimism. In fact, the main characters, the, the heroes of this story are two young people, two young ladies whose parents aren't even around to supervise them. I love this. I love this because we often want to say that the youth, the youth are the future. Yet Holy Scripture tells us time and time again that change happens, that miracles can happen when some of us older people get out of the way and we let young people 
be in charge. Because in their being in charge, in their bravery, in their outside of the box thinking, these two girls, these two girls change the history, not just of a baby, but of the world. As Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence, who's the Peter Marshall Professor of Preaching and Worship at Columbia Theological Seminary, says so profoundly, without these two girls, there is no Moses. There is no exodus, there is no liberation for the people of God, and there won't be unless the parents get off the stage and these young people get to setting things in motion. But friends, if I understand the text, these young ladies and all these women have something to speak to us today. You see, these two girls decided to get involved in some good trouble. One, one is from inside the power structure, and one is from outside the power structure, and together they defy the orders, the orders of their parents and of the nation, and of common decency and customs according to the grown-ups, and they conspire a plan. Think about it. Think about it. Because this, this was never mentioned in my flannel board stories. Nobody ever told me they were not listening to their parents. Probably wouldn't be a good thing to say to a preschooler, would it? But the fact is, Moses' sister was supposed to hide and watch and then report back. That's all. The princess, she was supposed to bathe and get dressed and go home. When the princess found the baby, she, she should have had one of the slaves, perhaps, perhaps be the one to drown it. And Miriam should have stayed hidden in those bulrushes. It was dangerous to step out of it, to step out of the shadows. And it certainly was crazy for her to recommend that the child's actual mother become the paid nursemaid of the baby. But there by the Nile, there by the Nile, they hatched a plan, a plan to save a baby's life. And they planned to do it no matter what their parents thought of it. And if you think about it, it's one of the craziest plans you've ever heard of. But they did it. Somehow these two got away with it. And when Moses was three years old, the princess actually adopted him. And this baby meant to be drowned in the river became a member of the palace court. And from there, from there the march to freedom for the Hebrew people continued. The plan was crazy. These girls were breaking laws and customs, but they were also being faithful, being faithful to that which was righteous. You see, sometimes, sometimes being faithful means stepping outside the lines. Sometimes, sometimes it means protest and civil disobedience. Sometimes it means you're going to get a little unpopular. Sometimes it means calling out lies and idolatries. And sometimes, sometimes the most radical thing you can do is speak truth and offer hope and embrace brothers and sisters in love. Even if it means doing that which the world would say was crazy. It means being subversive. You know, let me give you an example of those subversive things. You know, one of them is, is the giving of your hard-earned and well-invested money to the poor. Who would do such a thing? Of offering food to the hungry. Of loving sinners. Loving the unlovable 
of giving chances, giving chances to those, to those in the, that society has given up on. You know, the prisoner and the parolee and the addict. Of opening church doors to those very people. As I heard one crazy member of our church once did, allowing the parolee to make a phone call from their own home when they had nowhere to go and then befriending that person. Now for years and years and years, I understand. Especially, especially in this time of pandemic, we're considered hatching crazy plans when we go down and get in the reeds, when we venture into the bulrushes, cause the reeds are full of muck and they are smutty and they are slippery and they are dangerous. And their world says the last thing we should do, especially in a time of uncertainty, is risk ourselves by serving others. And yet that service, that service to others, that good trouble we get into might indeed change the world. You see, what all of these women did and whatever weeds they found themselves in, they did. Whatever it was, they did just that. They changed the world. The Reverend David Luz, former president of Lutheran Theological Seminary, states it this way. It is a courageous act of civil disobedience that changes history. For one of the boys that is spared will be called Moses, and he will lead the Israelites out of the Egyptian captivity. He will deliver God's law to the Israelites and bring them to the promised land. And it all starts here with women willing to say no to an act of injustice. I doubt very much they thought they were changing the world, but they were just by being faithful, by following the dictates of their heart and heeding the call to conscience. I don't know if you know of the author Andy Andrews. I've read several of his books, and one of those is a little book called The Butterfly Effect. It's worth reading if you get a chance. In this book, he catalogs the extraordinary impact of simple and courageous efforts. Except... Except when you go back, you can never really tell which effort made the biggest difference. Uh, let, me, let me give you a for instance. Well, one of them is a fellow named Norman Borlaw. You probably don't know Norman Borlaw, but, but, but your belly does. You see, he developed high-yield, high disease-resistant corn and wheat. And he's been credited with saving two billion lives from famine. Maybe that's the hero. Or maybe, maybe it's Henry Wallace. I couldn't remember who Henry Wallace was either. Henry Wallace was a one-term U.S. Vice President who in his term in office created, created a, a, a workshop, a laboratory, an office in New Mexico to develop the hybrid seed for arid climates. And he's the one who hired Borlaw to run it. Maybe we should give credit to Henry Wallace. Or, or, or maybe, maybe we should give credit to George Washington Carver who took a young Henry Wallace, never knowing he would be vice president, took him for long walks and instilled in him a love of plants. 
Or maybe. Maybe it should be Moses and Susan Carver who adopted the orphan George Washington Carver to be their son and made sure he got an education. Or, or maybe, it, well, you get the point, don't you? Andrews points out how interconnected our actions are, creating an unforeseen butterfly effect that can ripple across time and space and affect the lives of countless people. Friends, the things we do this week, our actions, our decisions, our choices, will in fact ripple out with consequences, some seen, foreseen, and some unforeseen, some for good and some for ill, some will create health and some will create destruction. The question isn't whether, but what we will do this week that will make a difference in the world. Yes, some of our actions may be bold. They may be big and courageous. Others, others, others may be small, hardly noticeable. And yet, Yet, whether they are an act of overt resistance or an act of kindness, they will ripple out, affecting countless lives. In today's reading, it, it was folks like Sarah and Kua who quietly stood up to a bully and a tyrant. Who knows whom it will be today or this next week or this next year. The Apostle Paul says that we all are members of the body of Christ, each with different gifts, yet all one in faith and with the same potential for God to use to change the world. Oh, friends. Friends, we are the church, and I believe the church was built for a time such as this. I pray that we will resist the call to conformity and to safety and to following a worldly path, and we will choose to seek first the kingdom of God, even if it means even if it means getting in a little bit of good trouble. And in doing so, perhaps justice will roll like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And the world will be changed, will be changed for good. Or as my good friend David Lamont reminds me, we are all changing the world, whether we like it or not. Friends, how will you change the world this week? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe Help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Having heard the word proclaimed, let us now confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. Friends, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to a time to the presentation of our offerings. You are reminded that there are numerous ways you can give to the life and the ministry of this church, both in the giving of your financial resources and your time and talents. If you live outside of this community, I encourage you to find ways to be involved in your own community. And if you're seeking an opportunity to give and make special gifts to this church, please let me know. Friends, freely we have received. Freely now let us give. With joyous and generous hearts, let us offer to God a portion of what God has entrusted to us. Let us worship as we give. Our offertory hymn is We Shall Overcome. Let us pray. Receive these gifts, gracious God. Bless them and distribute them in ways that reveal to the world your loving kindness and steadfast love. In a season of great upheaval and much uncertainty, may the giving of our resources and the sharing of our lives bring hope, 
comfort, and relief to those most in need of good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. testimony of our lives and ministry others glimpse clearly your goodness and compassion we hope that indeed the world knows we are your followers by our love where we have fallen short of that commandment forgive us and send your spirit to correct and transform us when we attempt to love you and our neighbors strengthen the urge and embolden our witness as the summer moves toward the fall, we admit our weariness with the ongoing threats brought on by this pandemic. We had hoped to be through the worst of this health crisis and all its fallout, moving headlong into the events and transitions that mark this time of year. Instead, we continue to navigate the troubled waters all around us. Unsure when the storm and all the damage it has wrought will come to an end. Quiet our anxious minds, Prince of Peace. Grant us courage for the living of these days. Do not let our faith fail when we need to put it into practice. We ask for wisdom as we seek to make decisions and act in ways that bring healing and wholeness to this brokenness. We feel within and see all around us. As followers of the one through whom all things are possible, give us vivid imaginations for how the difficulties of this time can be used by you to bring good and build communities of mutual care. Trust in your promise that even the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. We pray to take risks for the sake of the gospel that make the abund for abundant life for all people. We voice to you, who counts every hair on our head and our promises never to, to abandon us, the concerns we hold near to our hearts this day. Hear our prayers for those closest to us, for whom we worry and wonder how to support. Intervene from those farther from us, those who we do not know, those who we do not want to know, those only known to you. Call us, to, call us to you now, so that we will be drawn toward one another, and through you made one. A vision on earth of the multitude of tribes and nations, united in worship and praise. Make of us rocks upon which your church stands firm. A beacon of light that provides warmth, direction, and comfort to the world you so love. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, your Son who taught us to say together when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we leave, I want to let folks know to remember uh, Richard and Ray, and Ray at the loss of his sister in the last week. And we pray for God's mercy and presence during this time with Ray and his entire family. Folks, those women, those women didn't try to change the world or policies. They just loved the ones that were in front of them. And that loving, that loving changed the world. So as you go out into the world this week, go out in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. 
honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Go in